There are many steps one must take to reach their fullest potential for leadership and make a lasting change in their community. Now, a leader can't do this all alone. It takes unity and strength in numbers to make a true, lasting change. to create a lasting change. We hope that we have inspired you to be the change you want to see in the world. Welcome to Atlanta. I said, welcome to Atlanta. And welcome to the EEL National Conference. Now let's celebrate. South Carolina. Let's have another amazing round of applause for the Amman Academy dancers and the choreographer from Spelman College. As many of you know, Spelman College is a historically black college right here in the center of Atlanta, and it's a global leader in the education for women of African descent. I have put in my application, and I'm planning to attend next fall, so all you Spelman alumni out in the audience, keep an eye out. And my name is Emerson Fight, and I'm also a senior at River Bluff High School. Now, I think we can give a bit of a louder applause for the Amanda Academy students this morning. Amana Academy is the first K-8 STEM certified school in the state of Georgia. Both Amana Academy and Spelman College share a common mission to nurture citizen scholars who combine academic excellence with ethical character. Your collaboration is an inspiration. Thank you all for a great performance. All right, this year's conference is all about one vision, three dimensions. And here's how I understand this phrase. All teachers, leaders, and students in this room right now all believe the same exact thing. We all have one vision of smart students who are also great people contributing to a better world because we all know there is more to school than just test scores. As students, Emerson and I learn the content in each of our classes, from history to music theory to chemistry, everything. And then we also learn the academic skills, such as writing persuasive essay and public speaking. This is our mastery of content and skills. <laughs> <laughs> we also work together in each of our classes, especially in crew, to become better people and to work to make this world a better place. This is our work on character. We also focus on the ethic of excellence and everything that create our high quality work. These three dimensions combined come to support our one big vision here. Let me share with you what vision means to me. Since I was 10 years old, I've been working with my friends and family to support the pediatric hematology and oncology clinic at Prisma Children's Hospital in Columbia, South Carolina. Raising awareness, volunteering, gathering toys, and spending time with kids of all ages who are facing such horrible diseases. As I began middle school, two things happened. First, my own father was diagnosed with cancer. I saw firsthand the struggles families and patients faced during their time of need. I even lost a close friend to cancer. Second, like many girls, I began to lose, sorry, I began to lose my confidence in math and science. 
I began to believe the stereotype that boys are more analytical, independent, and better leaders, and that girls are more sensitive, helpful, and better followers. But during my freshman year at River Bluff, all of that changed. I found myself in an academic environment that put science, math, technology, and engineering into expeditions, into experiments, and into crew. I was able to make that spark of interest in STEM, and I knew I was going to become a pediatric oncologist. I'm now a senior, and I have a biology, anatomy, and chemistry. <laughs> Last year, I applied for an internship at the clinic, and I was gratefully accepted. I'm now two months in, and I've been able to shadow doctors, nurse practitioners, and specialists. I've so far learned how to take vitals, analyze different types of blood work, watch port accesses, learn and watch about different types of chemotherapy, and I am still learning so much more. I'm applying to the University of South Carolina, Clemson University, and the University of Chicago, and I hope I can attend medical school. If you told me in middle school I would be up on stage right now sharing where I've come, I probably wouldn't believe you. I hope that I can be a model for all young girls who have an interest in STEM and help contribute to a better world. Let me share with you what that vision means to me. I am a performing artist and have been dancing from the time that I was two and a half years old. Even as a young dancer, I've always been determined, driven, and a perfectionist. I would practice any challenging move for hours, drilling it into my body until I mastered it. It wasn't until River Bluff High School where I found an equally passionate and motivated dance coach, Mr. Garrison Hilton. Mr. Hilton has been my color guard coach, my dance team coach, and my school father. He's always given me kind, specific, and helpful critique, and always supported me to revise again and again. Through endless hours of practice, the willingness to accept critique, and the drive to revise again and again. We use this process in everything that we do in school, from posters, to presentations, to speeches, everything. As a senior, I've competed nationally and placed in the top 10 numerous times. I'm applying to the University of South Carolina, the College of Charleston, and Spelman College right here in Atlanta. I hope to pursue a career in news broadcasting and minor in dance. And I also hope to be a role model for all you young performing artists out there to have a never say you can't path to high quality work and success. Well, now that we've shared with you what vision means to us, turn to someone who you don't know, either in front or behind you, and discuss these questions. As a partner or friend of EL Education, how are you a part of this one vision and three dimensions? How does being here at this conference connect for you personally with contributing to a better world? in the first like 10 oh. seconds and I was like yeah, so next Of course, my brother and your dad are sitting beside each other. That's dangerous. That is really dangerous. Oh my gosh. They're 
actually like participating. Oh, and I know, this room is packed. Yes. But see, it doesn't seem like that many people to me, honestly. Uh, not at all. I don't know where the um, students are. I wish I would have put a timer like this. We all know this protocol. <laughs> oh, that was good. That was good. All right. Thank you, and thank you for the work you were doing across the country. From the East Coast to the West Coast, we are all one. From the rural schools to the large urban districts here, we are all one. We are working to support schools from around the country to become better people and to contribute to a better world. Speaking of better worlds, EL Education's signature event, Better World Day, is on the first Friday in May every year. This year, it's on Friday, May 1st, 2020. <laughs> Students demonstrate how their academic work connects to service, citizenship, and contribution in their community. Last year on Better World Day, over 100 EL schools shared their work, generating over two million social media posts showing the amazing things their students were doing. Okay, this year we have a cool new structure for our Better World Day. We are organizing four national teams to inspire action and to share work from across the country. We are asking schools and classrooms to join the national team that best fits their Better World Day plan. The Environmental Stewardship Team, the Housing, Hunger, and Homelessness Team, the Building Inclusive and Equitable Communities Team, and the Literacy for All Team. Stop by the Better World Day booth at the conference where you can meet amazing student ambassadors from River Bluff High School. <laughs> yeah. Get important information, enter contests, and get cool new swag. That's right. <laughs> Next, we'd like to show an example of Better World Day that would be on the Literacy for All team. This video highlights Detroit, Michigan. Yeah. Where every K-8 student in Detroit public schools is immersed in the three dimensions of student achievement through EL Education's literacy curriculum. Because of the little library, I started reading. One day I was just at the park and I saw like this little book. He said, I'm rocking my new shoes. My shoes are so blue. And you know, I just kept on reading books from that point on, on, on. I never knew that. Five years later that I would be painting, giving a little library to a whole bunch of kids. You know, I never thought this day would come. Here in Detroit, we live in the book desert. So, we teamed up with all these other kids from all these other schools to do something about it. We have created four little libraries. Without literacy, we can't access our human rights. Our class studied the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You have the right to be free, the right to be married. Like, if you don't know your rights, well, other people can just take them away from you. The literacy gap was actually an opportunity gap. We didn't have access to high quality curriculum. We have 80 K-8 schools adopting a brand new curriculum that really advances student knowledge beyond just the four walls of the classroom. We started with Esperanza Rising, and the students learned about the UDHR. And now they were immersed in it, using the curriculum, but in real life. And they learned about all the different organizations and how they protect human rights. They've done the research. They've actually taught their artists who work with them about the human rights. Really, in Detroit, all the kids have, you know, like different problems in the world. So I was just representing all the different patterns. That's my design. Like the boom box for just... Literacy is one of the main factors for succeeding in life. Help us build a library with your gently used books. We all have our equal talents, but we don't have equal access and opportunity to get books. So we started making these little libraries, and the four that we have are part of that effort that you guys are gonna to put together today. What is our goal? 850. 
How is it going? Are they going in there? We're getting these books from teachers and from students. Thanks to their help, we'll be able to give some to other kids. I'm going to paint my hand and I'm going to have different designs on it. Everybody has different personalities. And Mariah, she has a clock and she's basically saying it's time to read. 54. We have collected 1,158 books. Isn't that amazing? Thank you for this opportunity. Everyone thinking about making the world better at the same time, that's like a collective energy. We can have a better world. Not only that, we can have the children who are the future leading it. We can all play our part, just like the bees. Everybody has their own unique job where they're contributing to our super organism. Multiple schools, the district, multiple people coming together for one reason. They want literacy to matter and be something in all of our kids' lives. They are social activists, they are writers, they are readers, they are leaders to kids in this school and in the world. It means a whole lot to know that I, John L. Miller, have gave something to Detroit, you know, to have and to love. We had lots of help, but in the end, what you see up here, we did this. We are fifth graders from Detroit Public Schools, and we are here to contribute to a better world. Happy Better World. going to pass this legacy on down the road. Now, it is my honor to welcome to the stage two incredible students from Detroit, Michigan, from Burns Elementary Middle School, Yana Ferguson and John L. Miller. John L. Miller, I'm 11 years old, and I attend Burns Elementary Middle School. And I'm Xaviana Ferguson. John L. and I have a lot in common. We are both from the same neighborhood in Detroit, Michigan. We are both in the sixth grade. We both love to read, draw, and we are both very fast runners. All true. <laughs> All true. Please don't worry if you see me and Xaviana racing around outside. She's been bragging that she's faster than me, and I'm going to have to set her straight before we leave Atlanta. <laughs> I'm fascinated. Janelle, you're funny, because I am. <laughs> but all true, we rode a plane for the first time in our lives, and although we spoke to a large crowd at Better World Day, this audience is about 15 times bigger. <laughs> and it takes a lot of courage to speak in front of big crowds, but it's easier when we have each other. <laughs> for many of us growing up, <laughs> For many of us growing up in Detroit, life is a struggle. I am lucky. I have an amazing role model in my life. My mother, she's sitting right up front with my little sister, Tina. <laughs> to me, my mom is a very successful person. She has self-respect and expect respect from others, which is our district motto. She te She teaches me to never follow the crowd and to always be an individual. And in our family, we believe in trust, honesty, and to always do what is right, even when it is hard. My role model, sit right next to your role model. I went to with my, I went to with my Auntie Deborah and my cousin Michael when I was four years old. And living with my Auntie Deborah set me up for success in life. And my cousin Michael taught me how to be the man of the house. Like to wash the dishes, take out the trash, wipe the table. And mostly important, taking the initiative and helping out whenever it's possible. In our family, we believe in treating others the way you want to be treated. And always being good, even when no one is watching. And only bring an A's and B's home from school, never a C. <laughs> 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 
Last year's work at school was different in a lot of ways. First, we got the classroom to do field work at the Heidelberg Project. We were searching for inspiration that we could then draw our little light berries. We got to work with local artists who gave us sketch pads and access to draw meaningful things that we could then draw our little libraries to spark a press interest to open in the door. And second, we, got, we built those little libraries you just saw. And third, we got to celebrate our work in public, under a tent, and with cupcakes. <laughs> we couldn't have done all these amazing things on our own. I enjoy going to Burns Elementary Middle School. The teachers and staff are nice, and they always go above and beyond to help students. Our fifth grade teacher, Ms. Perry, she did a lot for us because she wanted us to be successful, and we'll always appreciate that. We also had the healthy guidance of our community partners who were super helpful and pushed us to be creative with our work. For example, Mr. Tim is Mr. Tim and Mrs. Nicole from Detroit Hobbs, who convert vacant lots all over the city into urban bee farms. And Mr. Knight, who supports young men as they exit juvenile detention and re-enter society. I loved, getting out to, I loved getting out to our community and meeting people who work to make Detroit a better place. Learning about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the EL curriculum and studying human rights in real life in Detroit made me feel powerful and hopeful. There are a lot of people out there who's doing what is right, even when it's hard, just like in my family. And by creating these little light berries, we're giving something valuable to our community and treating others the way we want to be treated, just like in your family. We are also proud to say that we are not alone with the students who work in Detroit. Every single public school student in Detroit up to eighth grade has taken on the challenge of the EL education curriculum. <laughs> it's amazing, and it's really hard. <laughs> but I gotta say, we do agree with the film. Literacy is a silver right. You can't learn to be a great reader and writer without hard work. The challenge is what makes it powerful. We hope more and more Detroit students out there learn to use their growing literacy skills to contribute to a better world. Also, having a chance to celebrate our accomplishments is so important. We were given the honor to speak on behalf of our classmates at Bitter World Day and again, here in Atlanta, knowing that our teachers, our families, our community partners, and all of you believe in us enough to listen has had the biggest impact on me and Xaviana. Being able to do all of this has been a tremendous honor, and we'll remember it for the rest of our lives. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you so much, guys. They have honestly become some of my favorite people to talk to. This, <laughs> I love them so much. All right. Were we that inspirational in fifth grade? Because I don't think so. I don't think we were. I, I, I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> well, we have more amazing kids on the way. Our next student project comes from a very different part of America, the teeny roll town of Silverton, Colorado. <laughs> Just like Detroit, all the students in Silverton are immersed in the three dimensions of student achievement. I'm sorry. Um, excuse me. I don't know. <laughs> All the students in Silverton are immersed in the three dimensions of student achievement. Just because Silverton is a little town, and it, they are EL through and through. We have to learn with our head and our heart. I think it is important in the midst of learning about injustices from the past that students are given the skills to get along with new and different people to hopefully build a better future. My name is Whitney Gaskell. I'm the fourth and fifth grade teacher here at Silverton. My students this semester went on a week-long road trip of Colorado and they really spent all semester leading up to that, gaining a lot of skills as historians. We met high schoolers that opened a museum that had done their part to keep history alive. We wanted to do that same thing here in Silverton and bring to light a story that is not very well documented here. It was time for the students to reflect and figure out how they can use what they've learned to make our community better. 
Because we focused so much on diversity throughout the semester, at the cemetery, I asked my students to look for clues. How diverse was Silverton in the past? My group noticed this weird stone. It didn't have a name on it, and it said, in memory of all the Chinese who lived and died in Silverton and who were denied burial in Hillside Cemetery. This marker kind of becomes the basis of what we've called our history mystery, and we go all over town looking for clues related to it. After we visit the cemetery, we visit our own local museum. Because the students have done so much field work, I use this day to challenge them to really evaluate the museum. I ask, does our museum do a good job of telling history from more than one perspective? Can we find any information about Chinese Americans? In the museum, I didn't see a lot of diversity. I saw a lot of mining history. We went to an archive. We found no clues, although the person we met with, Ray, he told us to look in newspapers from that time. So we looked in the newspapers, and that gave us lots of information. The Chinese came here because of the gold rush, but the miners didn't let the Chinese mine here because they will work for cheaper. Others say that the Chinese were going to take all the opportunities of businesses. Did you know the Chinese had a restaurant here but no people went to eat? Some people broke windows in their businesses. They put ropes around their necks and took them to the canyon and told them to hike away to scare them away. Uray thought the state should investigate because they were trying to kill and get rid of them. And Silverton was trying to cover it up. They treated them like animals to get them out of town. It was tragic. I think people should know about this. We should be in the newspaper or in the Denver Post. After our visit to the museum and archives, we brainstormed how we could use what we've learned so far to make the world better. We could add more things to our museum, like diverse cultures, so that way your museum could tell more than one perspective and more points of view. We brainstormed all the ways we knew to keep history alive and voted on our favorite ones. Now we had some goals for our Better World project. We wanted to rebuild something, tell a story, and create an exhibit. We went on a hike to see where they planted their garden, but it didn't look like there was a garden there. They had to walk three miles to get to their garden because they were excluded. So we are making a garden with things they grew in Silverton. This is our way to help make it fair. Now we know what we can build, a garden. But we want to make an exhibit and we don't have any artifacts. We decided to write letters to the State Museum. Take your letter from the History Colorado Society. Yay! We have received your letters and requests for a donation of historic artifacts for your exhibit at the San Juan County Historical Museum. Yes! We would be quite honored to assist with your exhibit by loaning a small representation of objects associated with the Chinese American community from the turn of the 20th century. Yes! Now that we know we are getting artifacts, we want people to come to our grand opening. Colorado has lots of diverse places and people, so our museum should have lots of diverse artifacts. We need to have more information about different cultures in our museum because we need to remember all history. It is important to bring this up so we do not make the same mistake again. We need to learn to be less hateful to other cultures. It's amazing to see students take what they've learned to really contribute to our community. They walk away from this project with the knowledge that certain parts of history can be erased if people don't step up to preserve it. And they got to be the ones to do that. Now, two superstars from this video and possibly the cutest kids I've ever met in my entire existence. Please welcome to the stage Alejandro Torres and Corelli Ortega Ortez from the Silverton School. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alejandro Torres, and I am honored and excited to be with you all today. And my name, and my name is Carly Ortega. We are only 12 years old, and we're getting to do something most people 
people will ever do. Speak to an audience over 1,500 people. That's extra special for us, considering there are only 650 people in our whole town, total. <laughs> That's true if you took every teacher, student, parent, grandparent, kid, doctor, store owner, and police officer. Basically, everyone we know in our tiny town and put them together, it would only fill half this room. <laughs> but we are ready. But let me be honest with you. I haven't always been this brave. You saw our video, but what the video didn't show is that I was terrified to be away from home for a week. In the past, I would refuse to go on field work, but because we are an EL education school, we get the opportunity to learn outside the classroom, and I've learned that's not an opportunity I should turn down. Helping others is a good motivation on getting brave. Getting brave enough to go on field work made me brave in other ways that grew and grew until now. I am standing here before all of you, something I never thought was possible. That's right, Alex. I was so proud of you for going on that trip with us, and I'm so glad to be with you here today. Alex and I are cousins and been friends our whole lives. We have celebrated birthdays together, holidays together, <laughs> played together, <laughs> fought a few times, <laughs> and now we're here sharing the stage in Atlanta. <laughs> Last year, we had to be open-minded to learn the diverse perspectives of elders who have survived some of the darkest moments in our state's history. We connected with pen pals who have very different lives than we do. Work like this not only made me feel like a real historian, but also a person who sees the value in everyone's story. To learn more about people's different stories, we read lots of nonfiction and realistic fiction. We even analyzed real artifacts stored in chunks to simulate what Mexican, Japanese, and African-American families packed as they bravely journeyed to Colorado. I loved opening all those chunks and seeing all the different pretty things. I knew there were treasures helping a family start a new life. I loved how different everything was. It made me think, I actually want my friends to be different from me. When I go to a friend's house and the food is different, that makes it more fun. And when they come to my house, they can have enchiladas. <laughs> yeah, we saw lots of patterns too. Even though those families were different, we could see that everyone packed something that showed how much they loved their children, culture, family, and dreams for a good life. That makes sense to me, because I feel like I'm part of two cultures. I was born in the United States to a Mexican mother. I'm Mexican and American. I'm both. I feel comfortable in both cultures. Siempre en los dos. As you can see, this learning was very personal. These documents and artifacts were bringing history to life for us. We met Amachi survivor Jack Kamura. Amachi was in an internment camp in Colorado that held Japanese Americans wrongfully from 1942 to 1945. Mr. Kamura told us of a bad time in a calm way. History was important and gave us the opportunity to learn the truth of what really happened at Amachi. We quickly realized that our project on the treatment of immigrants in America was still around today. All we had to do was watch the news to see that immigration is an important issue in America. Most people we met along the way were surprised by the contact we were focused on or how much we were taking on. They seemed to wonder if our topic were appropriate for kids our age to be studying. They seem to think kids should be sitting in classrooms with worksheets. We were out in the world meeting all kinds of people, digging through artifacts, asking uncomfortable questions that people rather forget or cover up. And to that I say, we're the next generation, so might as well learn this difficult stuff now. That way we know better for our future.
Most people we knew had no idea that Chinese people ever lived in t town. We knew we had to tell the truth to our community and the world. We created a whole exhibit to uncover the history of Chinese immigrants in S Silverton. We rebuilt a Chinese garden in the middle of town. We planted Chinese vegetables, which we learned are perfect for high elevation. Now our generation can appreciate this piece of Chinese culture that is so beautiful. When the garden was planted and our artifacts were safely displayed, we presented all of our findings at a grand opening. Besides the exhibit, we performed an original play of historical fiction. We wore full costumes, had great scripts, and performed to a full house. Most people we knew, oh, sorry. We know y'all believe in kids doing real work that matters. We know y'all can see how much kids can accomplish if we get the chance. We are brave enough to go in the world, caring enough to listen to the stories of different people we met along the way. Oh, along the way, and prepare with, with skills that will allow us to bring history to life. We made a difference, and so can you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alejandro and Corelli. It is not easy to follow inspirational student speakers, especially when they are as amazing as these four students. But next, we have a very special speaker who could probably follow anyone. He's a world famous educational leader who served as US Secretary of Education under President Obama. He is currently <laughs> the CEO and president of the Education Trust, a nonprofit organization that, like EL, works for equity and justice in education. We are pleased to have him in house, in person. Please welcome to the stage Dr. John B. King, Jr. Thank you so much, good morning. I'm very grateful to the EL education team for extending the invitation for me to speak here today. It's certainly an honor to be here and an honor to follow such amazing students. Can we give the students another round of applause? In many ways, this feels like a full circle moment, seeing many familiar faces from my time in New York as Commissioner of Education. EL Education was instrumental in creating content for New York's Engage New York effort, which has offered educational resources to more than 17 million users since the resources went online in 2011. It's great to see the continuation of the work in such capable hands. And thank you for the wonderful introduction, Emerson and Janaya, between the two of them and Lucas Clamp, the 2018 Principal of the Year. It's clear that greatness is cultivated at River Bluff High School. You know, there are a lot of things that I appreciate about EL education, but what tops the list is how student-centered the model is. There is no better way to start the day than hearing from young people who are excited to learn and who are doing real work to make both their communities and the world a better place. And that's what I'd like to speak about this morning, connecting our work, whether we are educators or students, to the active pursuit of a more equitable and just society. I'd like to start this morning by sharing something that I was reflecting on as I traveled here to Atlanta today. Recently, I was reading a Time Magazine piece remembering the life and legacy of civil rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer, who was famous for her tireless efforts traveling throughout the country registering African Americans to vote in the 1960s. Her birthday was actually just last week. The article recounted a story about Fannie Lou Hamer's characteristic and unapologetic boldness in pursuit of her mission. One day she traveled to Mississippi to a place known then as Indianola's Negro Baptist Church. There she addressed a mass meeting of the faithful, urging them to take action in the civil rights 
and voting rights movements. She said, you can pray until you faint, but if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. Now, as that article I was reading points out, the fact that Fannie Lou Hamer would tell a church full of religious people that prayers would only take them and their movement but so far shows her commitment to bold, unapologetic advocacy and activism. And it's the core of Fannie Lou Hamer's message that I really want all of us to reflect on today, that each one of us has a responsibility to work, yes, boldly and unapologetically toward creating, maintaining, and defending a more just and equitable society. Each one of us has the responsibility to get up and try to do something. And that starts with education. This is a theme that we just saw highlighted in the videos from EL Education Schools in Detroit and Silverton through their Better World Day projects. Educators were committed not only to their students' acquisition of knowledge in core academic subjects, as vital as that is, but also to the application of that learning. Educators ensured that their students would make the world better by getting up and doing something with what they learned. We saw students engaged in deep research, field work, interviews, site visits to historic places, and the actual construction of projects that can help to solve real world problems, like addressing a lack of access to books in neighborhoods in Detroit or ensuring that every community's stories and histories are truthfully represented in a local Colorado museum. This type of rich, engaging, interdisciplinary learning is what every child across the country deserves. And it's the type of learning that EL education strives to deliver in every school that adopts the EL model. I know the power of a rich, well-rounded education and excellent teachers because I experienced that power myself firsthand as a child. Some of you may know that I grew up in New York City. I went to New York City public schools. Both my parents were career New York City public school educators. And they couldn't have known, although they dedicated both of them their lives to New York City public schools, the difference New York City public schools would make in their son's life. And both my parents passed away when I was a kid. Uh, my mom passed away when I was eight in October of fourth grade. Uh, my dad passed away when I was 12. And during the period that I lived with my dad, and it was just the two of us, and he was very sick with undiagnosed Alzheimer's. So home was this place where I didn't know what my father would be like from one night to the next. Some nights he'd talk to me, some nights he wouldn't, some nights he'd be angry, some nights sad. I can recall uh, one night when he woke me up, two in the morning, told me it was time to go to school. I remember being on the staircase in our house, arguing with him about whether or not it was time to go to school. I remember he started pulling me down the stairs. I was holding on to the banister, insisting to him, Daddy, it's not time to go to school. It's the middle of the night. And I remember I didn't know why he was acting like that, but that's what home was like, night after night, this place that was scary and inconsistent and incredibly lonely. But the thing that saved me, the reason I'm standing here today, is amazing New York City public school teachers who created an environment that was safe, compelling, engaging, interesting, loving. I had a teacher in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, Mr. Osterweil. He looped with us, which is very unusual in New York City public school at the time. Mr. Osterweil's classroom was this amazing place that introduced me to a whole world beyond Canarsie, Brooklyn. We read the New York Times every day in Mr. Osterweil's class. I always say he was doing college and career ready standards before we called them <laughs> college and career ready standards. We did productions of A Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare in elementary school. We did a production of Alice in Wonderland. I was the rose in Alice in Wonderland with big red felt petals sticking out of my head. <laughs> and I remember the things we did in Mr. Osterweil's class like it was yesterday because his classroom was so impactful. It was the one place where I could be a kid when I couldn't be a kid at home. He was the kind of teacher, like so many in this room, when you finished a book, he was there with the next. When you finished a math problem, he was there with another that was a little more challenging. One of the great honors of my life was when I was sworn in as secretary. Mr. Osterweil was able to be there. And I was able to, in some small way, thank him for the difference that he made in my life. But his classroom, 
His classroom saved me. It would have been very easy for him and the other teachers I had uh, growing up to look at me and say, here's an African-American, Latino male student, family in crisis. What chance does he have? It would have been very easy for them to give up on me. But they didn't. They saw in me more potential than I could even see in myself. The fact that I'm not in prison or dead today is because of the influence of excellent teachers who provided me with a well-rounded, relevant, engaging education. Teachers in EL schools understand that students thrive with high-quality educational experiences that are tied to high standards and that draw students in as doers, thinkers, creators, producers, and agents of positive change in their communities. Now, the work happening in Rochester, New York, at one of EL's longest standing network schools, Genesee Community Charter School, is a great example of this. Veteran, that's right. They're trying to do for kids what Mr. Osterwild did for me, trying to create that space that is safe, nurturing, challenging, and engaging. Veteran sixth grade social studies teacher Chris Dolgus has created a wealth of opportunities for students to engage in rigorous academics while contributing to making the surrounding community more just and equitable. A couple of years ago, Mr. Dolgos led the inaugural implementation of his school's Better World Project, which explored Rochester's growth and revitalization, as well as the changes and tensions in the community caused by gentrification and the resulting displacement of some of the city's longtime residents. Through writing and art, Mr. Dolgus's students examined important questions, including whose renaissance is this? Who's telling the story of the renaissance? Who is benefiting most? Who is being left out of the conversation? And those questions led to self-reflection. What do we value as a community? Who do we value as a community? While working to examine Rochester's identity, the students also did a lot of work to explore their personal identities. Mr. Dolgos brought in the Teaching Tolerance Organization via a grant, which allowed his students to collaborate with a local author. Students wrote their own stories about identity and what it meant for them to live in Rochester. Students also had the opportunity to team up with a local artist on a mural project called The Rock Believers to better understand Rochester's neighborhoods. It's inspiring to see the impact that the EL education model had on Mr. Dolgus' students, their learning, and their understanding of critical social justice questions related to changes happening in their very own city. Mr. Dolgos, a 24-year veteran teacher, also explains that the EL education experience pushed him outside of his comfort zone, helping him grow new skills in his approach to instruction. He readily notes that EL education inspired him to look beyond the standards in the social studies curriculum to interrogate pedagogical questions such as how can kids become agents of their own learning and how can teachers equip students with the right tools as readers, writers, historians, and scientists to effectively make positive change right where they live. Those are the kinds of experiences that EL makes possible and that have long-lasting impacts not only on students' engagement in their learning, but also in terms of how they show up in society as good citizens who can contribute to their communities. Mr. Dolgos said many of his former sixth graders still remark on how powerful it was for them to work on the Better World Project. I'm sure so many of you in this room have had similar experiences with your students. And all of this comes back to what I asked us to reflect on today. How do we, how do we as educators and as students get up and try to do something in the active pursuit of a more just and equitable society? The EL education program helps educators and students do this very thing. What I find particularly powerful about the EL education model is that it combines socio-emotional learning, character building, and rigorous academics with ensuring that students have a strong sense of personal ownership over high quality work and that they can take action with a purpose through their academic learning. Importantly, the model is also informed by research and evidence of what works. The Better World Project, as a matter of fact, was created because of the strong research-informed connection between students' socio-emotional learning and academic achievement. Studies have shown social and emotional skills help to build 
cognitive skills. They help students learn academic content and apply their knowledge. In fact, recent research suggests that supporting students' socio-emotional development can make a meaningful, significant difference in students' academic performance and even their test scores. And EL Education Partner Schools widely cite the melding of socio-emotional learning and academics with their students graduating on time and being accepted into college. Many EL high schools have succeeded in ensuring that 95% of their students graduate within four years and that 100% of their graduates enroll in college. In Rochester, the research-based Better World project was so successful that Genesee has continued the model and expanded participation in socio-emotional learning and academic learning across all of their grades. Third graders have been able to research environmental justice issues as they examine deforestation climate change, and habitat loss happening in the local environment. And this year, Mr. Dolgos' sixth grade class is exploring the creation of a conflict resolution project for their school. To create an even more welcoming, safe, and inclusive school environment, students have discussed implementing a new handbook on how to be a peer mediator, how to resolve conflict peacefully, and how to build in restorative justice and responsive classroom practices into Genesee's school policies. If we are collectively to advance equity and justice through our work, I'd like to suggest that all the educators in the room ask of ourselves the same questions that Mr. Dolgos' students at Genesee Community Charter School asked. Number one, who's telling the story? I've been encouraged to see students leading here at today's conference by sharing their experiences. In just a few moments in a panel discussion with students, Students will raise their voices and give us advice about what they need in order to be successful. Indeed, in the video we saw earlier, we heard Ms. Pamela Hornbuckle, who teaches fifth grade in Detroit, talk about how she saw the student dialogue was key to her students' growth in core academic subjects. When we think about who is telling the story in education, we should always ensure that students are centered. We should also ensure that data is part of the story and informing our work at every step of the way. There's growing research and data that shows, for example, that EL Education's literacy partnerships are driving higher student achievement in EL schools. A recent study by Mathematica Policy Research reveals that students in schools with EL literacy partnerships had significantly higher achievement in English language arts. And in Detroit, after just one year of literacy partnership, Students in all tested grades earn the highest ever scores on Michigan's English language arts assessment. <laughs> and this is hugely important in a state whose, who, whose progress has stalled in a state where uh, Michigan ranks uh, 16th from the bottom in reading performance and on their current trajectory would be 45th in the country by 2030. Detroit is interrupting that trajectory with the work with EL education. The second question that we should ask ourselves in advancing equity and justice through education is who is benefiting most? As a nation, we know that despite the fact that our children's potential and genius are ubiquitous and universal, the benefits of a high quality education are not distributed evenly. Students of color and students from low income backgrounds consistently receive less. Less access to outstanding, well prepared, well supported and diverse educators. Nationally we know that students of color and students from low income families too often are assigned to new, uncertified or less effective teachers than their peers. Students of color and low income students often get less access to school counselors. We know, for example, that there are 1.6 million students in the United States who attend a school where there is a sworn law enforcement officer and no school counselor. The school to prison pipeline in a single data point. Latino students are 40% more likely than white students to attend a school with a sworn law enforcement officer and no school counselor. And black students are 20% more likely. Often, low-income students and students of color get less access to rigorous coursework. Indeed, we know students of color and low-income students are more likely to attend high schools where you can't even take chemistry or physics or algebra two, not to mention AP and IB courses. 
But in our research at the Education Trust, we've also shown that even when the courses are offered in their high school, low-income students and students of color are underrepresented in those courses. Indeed, there are half a million students of color and students from low-income families who would be participating in AP and IB if they were just participating in proportion to their presence in the school. Similarly, we know that nationally, white students are twice as likely to be enrolled in algebra in eighth grade as their black and Latino peers. Too often, we know low-income students and students of color get less access to resources. Uh, we did a study called Funding Gaps at, at the Education Trust and showed that across the country, low-income students were on average getting $1,000 less per pupil than districts serving more affluent students. And all of us know that many states represented in this room, that gap is even larger, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, five, even $10,000 differences in spending between school districts. We also showed in that study that the gaps are actually larger based on race. And when you compare districts that have large numbers of students of color, they're getting about $1,800 less per pupil on average than districts that have very few students of color. Third, to boldly and unapologetically work toward advancing equity and social justice through education, we must ask ourselves who's being left out of the conversation. Across the country, despite the fact that a majority of students in our public schools are students of color, only 18% of our teachers are teachers of color, only 2% of our teachers are African American men. Diversifying the education workforce should be a national priority when we know the benefits that teachers of color provide to all students, both students of color and to white students. Certainly we know white students benefit from seeing educators of color as leaders and mentors in their classrooms and schools. I have a friend who says, it's a little bit harder to be racist if you learn math from a, learn calculus from a black teacher. Not impossible, but a little bit harder <laughs> to be racist. A recent report also showed that having just one African-American teacher in elementary school reduced the chances that African-American students would drop out of high school by 29%. For African-American boys from very low income backgrounds, the results were even greater. Their chance of dropping out fell by nearly 40%. As one of my good friends and colleagues likes to say, educators of color are nation builders. But too often, educators of color feel marginalized and silenced. The Education Trust surveyed black and Latino educators and found that educators of color often feel that they have to tone down their personalities in the schools where they work, and that their voices are not fully heard by school leaders and by many of their white colleagues. Ed Trust just released recently a report entitled, If You Listen, We Will Stay that explored why educators of color leave the classroom. Some of the top reasons that emerged were because educators felt that they experienced an antagonistic school culture, and they perceived that they were undervalued and deprived of agency and autonomy. We heard from teacher after teacher about an invisible tax experienced by teachers of color. We heard from African-American male teachers who experienced the tax of being expected to be the disciplinarian in their schools. We heard from Latina teachers about the tax of being expected to be the translator for families. And it's not that folks don't want to contribute in those ways, but they're often not compensated, not recognized, not given leadership opportunities. And so to the school leaders in the room, I would ask you to think about what more can you do to support your educators of color. And to the teachers in the room, I would ask you to consider the ways that you can support each other so that each of you is respected and valued, so that everyone's voice is heard. And also challenge us all to think about teacher diversity in terms of linguistic diversity as well. We desperately need more bilingual teachers in the United States, and we need to recognize that students speaking a language other than English at home is an asset, not a deficit. <laughs> We have to invest in our students becoming bilingual and biliterate and wanting themselves to become teachers. We also have to see diversity, equity, and inclusion as the work of institutions, not individuals. Right? I can recall having the experience of being asked when I was a teacher, hey, John, it's Black History Month. What are we doing this year? 
right, that we can't put the responsibility for diversity, equity, and inclusion on educators of color alone. Again, it is an institutional responsibility. All of us have to work always towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. Fourth, to advance equity and justice, we have to interrogate what do we value as a community. To do this, we first have to recognize that what happens inside and outside of school absolutely matters for our students' success. We have to reject the false dichotomy that suggests we have to care about only one or the other. If our students are hungry, if our students are homeless, if our students are dealing with violence in the community, if students are living with family members who are struggling with addiction, all of that contributes to our students' experience of school. I think about a study that was done recently at Johns Hopkins, which you all will find fascinating, a shocking study. Uh, they looked at students who couldn't see the board or read the book because of vision issues. And it turns out they did worse in school as a result. Shocking, I know. <laughs> and then they invested in an intervention. They got students proper vision care. And this is the really shocking part. It turns out if you can see the board and read the book, you do better in school, <laughs> right? And I make light of this study not, not because it, it wasn't a good study. It was a good and important study. But the sad thing is we aren't doing anything about it. And so there are kids today in classrooms all across America who are not getting the academic opportunities they should because they can't see, because they haven't gotten the vision care that they need. We shouldn't see vision care as denying anyone's responsibility to make school as good as possible. At the same time, we have to hold ourselves accountable for addressing kids' needs beyond a great curriculum, as important as that is, beyond great teaching, as crucial as that is. We have to address students' full humanity. We have to see their full humanity. We have to recognize the challenges that stand in the way of their success and let them know that we value them and their high achievement above everything else by providing them with all the supports that they need to reach their potential. And finally, to truly do this equity and justice advancing work, we must ask, who do we value as a community? And it really isn't cheating to say the answer to this question is the same as the previous question. The answer always has to be our students, particularly those who are most vulnerable. And at this moment in our nation's history, that could not be more urgent. When students of color see innocent people of color being unjustly murdered in incidents of police violence, when undocumented students and students from mixed status families sit in class worried about ICE raids and fearing that they'll be separated from their families, when LGBTQ students see a daily assault on their civil rights, and transgender students, in particular, see a concerted effort in some places to erase their very identity. When students in rural communities see young people who want to stay near family forced to leave in search of economic opportunity. When students live in daily fear of gun violence, from tragic mass shootings like Sandy Hook or Parkland, to the grinding daily shootings in cities like Chicago and Baltimore, or when young people worry about the very future of human existence on this planet with the looming impact of climate change, we have a responsibility to stand up for them and with them. We must center their future, their voices, and their leadership. And that truly is the best transition to what we're about to do next, which is to talk with a group of students that you've heard from already about their experience in EL schools. And I will say that EL has been forward-thinking in its models, bridging rigorous curriculum and a focus on socio-emotional socio learning and academic learning and social justice, all with the goal of maximizing student outcomes. I have two daughters in public schools in Maryland, one in middle school and one in high school. I'm going to leave quickly after the conference today to get back for my daughter's 16th birthday. Um, and both of them are deeply passionate about building a more just society. They both have participated in marches and protests around gun violence and around climate change. And I think about them and the kind of education I want for them. 
Yes, I want them to have powerful academic skills. Yes, I want them to be prepared to succeed in college and careers. And yes, I want them to be prepared to be the future leaders of our country and our world. And those goals aren't in competition. What EL demonstrates day after day is that those goals are actually deeply interconnected. If we ask ourselves, what kind of school do we want for our own children, then that's what we should provide for other people's children. If we ask ourselves, that's right. <laughs> if we ask ourselves, what kind of school experience do our students need to be the leaders of our community tomorrow, then that's the kind of education we'll provide, one that brings together building students' academic skills, their readiness for college and careers, and their readiness to be participants in our democracy, to lead the way toward a better future for their communities and for our country. I'm excited to see the great work that all of you will continue to do for educators and for students who, because of their connection to EL, are inspired and better prepared, as Fannie Lou Hamer urged, to get up and try to do something. And with that, I look forward to our conversation with the students. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you. Let's have another round of applause for Dr. King. <laughs> now we're gonna have Alejandro, Corelli, Janelle, and Xaviana, I'm sorry, <laughs> for a brief conversation with Dr. King. Y'all can come on up. Yeah. All right, can we have another round of applause for these amazing students? So I'm super excited to talk with all of you, and everyone in this room is super excited to hear from you. We got to see you in the videos and got to hear from you a little bit this morning. I'd love for you each to talk about your experiences with the EL curriculum and the projects you've been doing in your schools and to try to explain for us what you think the positive impact of the projects you've done has been on you. So we'll start with you, Yana, and then we'll go just down the row. The impact that the project has had on me is that, the, well, the greatest impact is that I got to help other kids become better reader, writers, and it just feels very good to help other kids. I also help myself and be able to do all of this and tell other kids that it's okay to be, just go out and express yourself and be confident and take that opportunity to do whatever. Like if, like this, if you have opportunity like this, take it, it is okay, and yes. I guess the biggest impact for me was discovering things, like how we discovered that Chinese vegetables are perfect for growing in high elevations. Oh, great, thank you. So, so, okay, so <laughs> the biggest impact on me, it has made me a better reader and writer because of our Think Pair Share product. A pro project. So, so basically, it's when our teacher give you a top a topic, you pair up with your classmates, and basically you share it out to your whole class. So, this project has basically helped me become a better reader, writer, and thinker. Yeah, um, what I think. 
what impact did the project have on you? What effect did the project have? Mm. Oh, got it, sorry. Field work was like the most, because like um, whenever we go to like do field work, I mean like reading helps learning, but like going out to field work helps more because like, because <laughs> last, like, like two years ago, whenever we were learning about like Chinese in, in our town, we went to like the actual, like Amachi, and it helped me more than just reading a book and imagining it. And like field work, it's probably like the puzzle pieces, like getting all the puzzle pieces. And then when we go to the classroom, like all together as a classroom, we like connect all the puzzle pieces and it's like, we do that. All right, so let me ask you next to talk about, and Janelle, you raised this a little bit, the academic benefits of doing projects. And you could talk about your Better World project, but you can talk about other projects that you've done in school. But some people would say, well, it's great that you're doing projects that make the world better, but how are they helping you as a student? Well, it helped me like read by like, because like we, um, we whenever we read, um, we would read like in the old newspapers from the, I can't say this, archive? archives, archives, I can't say that. And then um, we put a lot of notes while we were in field work, so that helps a lot on writing skills. And then it made me really think about like, if there's other places where like they hide stuff that has happened around the world. So basically, this project has helped me become better with my classmates. Because really, before this, I really wasn't close to my classmates. But but being able to work with them and, and being able to think about what about how we're going to make the little libraries and how we're going to paint them made me and my classmates became closer to each other. So the uh, project that we did a couple of years ago made me think how we can help the world with water. Like maybe one day we could take water to Africa so they don't have to be hiking every day. The water. Yeah, like Janelle said, uh, last year we did get to work with all our classmates. It was a very fun. It was very fun to just sit and work with your classmates and work together and think about all the things that you can do and help other people. And it helped me become a better student because, like I said, I became a great reader and even better writer. All right, so the work that, that I do is about trying to make the country more fair for everyone, right? especially for students, and to try to make sure that schools are fair places. What do you see either about schools or about how society is that you think is unfair, that you want all of us as adults to try to change or make better? And we could start with whoever wants to go first. All right, Janelle, <laughs> go for it. OK, so some other schools don't have technology, and so Dr. V, Dr. Vitti and yeah, 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 Superintendent Dr. Vitti is trying to make that not happen. He wants all kids in the school to be able to have their own technology, just like in Detroit. We have our own technology, and and I uh, and I think that it would be fair that all kids can have their own technology because it's fun. Uh, 
Uh, so I think bowling is a lot is like a trouble because, like, instead of focusing on your work, you focus on what the other person is saying, I guess. And like in our school, like if something like that happens, we do a restorative justice circle, and a lot of schools don't do that. And like, yeah. So it's a student tells on the other student to a teacher, and then we form all together, the three people, the student, the teacher, and the other student to talk about what happened. You have a sheet of paper, and you talk about the harm that was done, ways you can fix it, and then at the end, you just shake it off, and you're friends again. <laughs> OK, so. It's not fair. Uh, our schools are not fair because some schools don't have academics, such as art, music, drama, and other and other academics like that. And now that Superintendent Dr. Avidi is here to help and provide all that for all schools and students, and. Like in the past, like I said, most schools didn't have those kind of academics. But now Superintendent Dr. Vidi is here, all schools are ha are have those now. They have all those academics now for all the kids and students. Oh, did you get um, I have to agree with Alex. Kind of like, like Alex said, like um, about bullying. Kind of like whenever like they get bullied, they don't focus on student, like school and stuff. What should we do about that? Probably like um, if there is bullying, like just like Alex said, or do a restored um, circle so like they don't have to think about that whenever they're doing their class. All right, so we just have time for one more question. So you have this room of all of these teachers and principals, and so I want you to describe what you think makes school great. Like, what should, what, if you were describing to someone what makes for a great teacher, what makes a great classroom project, what do you want as a student? Like, you're the customer of schools, right? And so we want to know, everyone in this room wants to know, what do the customers think? What do the customers want? Yeah, you ready, Yana? <laughs> so STEAM Club is one that we have, and our fifth grade teacher, Ms. Perry, Ms. Perry is not here this year. Ms. Perry went to go work at another school. But last year, we had a program called STEAM. STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Mathematics. Basically, at the end of the day and after school, and um, sometimes kids will go with uh, Miss Perry, like at lunch, if they wanted to, and we would work on like things like science and mathematics and stuff like that. It was very fun, and also it helped us be prepared for any challenges that we have to face, and be prepared for anything. And that STEAM club can help a lot, and other schools should have STEAM club also. Okay, so I think schools should have homework club. It's always in the mornings or in the afternoons at our school. So like if we have soccer or like cross country or anything like that, we can either go in the morning or have missing homework. But um, yeah, I think homework club. Okay, um, I really think that we need a reading club because reading is my favorite subject. So, <clears throat> so ELA, yeah. So, so basically, I love ELA because you just like to have your imagination just flow throughout the book. And yeah, we really do need a reading. Can I put you on the spot for a, a follow-up question? Do you have a book recommendation? Like, what's the best book you've read Ooh. recently? Oh, Percy Jackson. Oh, nice. 
<laughs> okay. All right. Nice. Corelli. Um, I think that we would, like students should be sent more to field work because kind of like I said earlier because like it it makes you learn more than just sitting and reading in your classroom and watching videos because you actually can experience it. And also if it's like tragic or something or it's not for kids, I think kids should still, still learn it because we can handle it even like we did. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Thank you guys for a great conversation. Thank you for being brave and sharing your experience in school with all these educators in this room who are excited about your future and committed to your success. So thank you for this conversation. Can everyone please join me in giving a round of applause to our fantastic students. Thank you. No, you can leave. speakers this morning. <laughs> Next, I'd like to welcome to the stage EL Education's President, Scott Hartle. Thank you, Emerson and Janiyah. Corelli, Alejandro, John L. Liana, I know I speak for the whole room today when I said, you killed it. Right? <laughs> Thank you for sharing your work and your voices with us. Um, we do this work for you. John, thank you for being here, for interacting with our students, and for crafting a talk that spoke so directly and authentically to us. <laughs> you affirm the great deal of what a Yale education is about, and your call to action for us to focus even more sharply on the pursuit of a more equitable and just society is heard, right, loud and clear. Um, we've heard a lot this last hour. So let's take a minute, three in fact, to uh, talk a little bit about what you've heard. So I invite you in a moment to turn to a person next to you and to share a headline from what you have taken away from John's words or the voices of our students. The prompts are on the, um, on the screens in a moment. And in three minutes, I'm going to raise my hand, but I need your attention back. Turn and talk. Thank you for your attention. That certainly deserved more time. There is one last element of our program, though, that I am committed to us getting to. So we have seen some incredible students up on stage today. And now it's time to turn our focus to some incredible schools. So because in just a moment, we have the pleasure of introducing to you five new EL credentialed schools. So what is credentialing? One definition of EL credentialing is that it is a rigorous, multi-year, evidence-based process of demonstrating high standards across an expanded definition of student achievement. Earning an EL credential is not easy. Another definition of EL credentialing is that it's a vision of what school can be. EL credentialed schools inspire us. They show us what is possible. There are 36 EL education credential schools out there. If you are at one of those EL education credential schools, if you work there or if you're involved in any way, can you stand for a moment and let us recognize you? Thank you for leading the way. The credential is meant to demonstrate to the world what an evidence-based approach that shows all kids in all kinds of communities and all schools can rise to a standard of excellence across a broad range of skills that we believe will equip them and you for work and life. That's the message of credentialing. And now, to help me recognize the five schools earning their EL credentials this year, 
We have up on stage with us the EL education staff that matter most to this work, the field directors and coaches who work with this remarkable group of schools. And to start us off, I'd like to ask Christina Kyle Smith and Megan DeRitter to join. Good morning, my name is Christina Kyle Smith and I'm the Regional Director for the Mid-Atlantic Region. Hi, I'm Megan DeRitter, School Designer for the Region. And we are pleased to announce Campbell as a newly credentialed EL school for the 2019 school year. Good morning, my name is Kyle Hastings and I am the Chief Schools Officer for New York City Outward Bound Schools. And I'm Hillary Rosenfield, School Designer, and we are so proud to present Channel View School for Research as an EL credentialed school. Good morning, I am Roel Mason Vivit, the Regional Director for Illinois Wisconsin. And I'm Sarah Miller, School Designer, and we are proud to announce Frank Elementary as a newly credentialed school of 2019. My name is Jen Wood. I'm the Regional Director for Colorado and Utah. And I'm Lene Krijan, School Designer in the Mountain Region. And we are pleased to announce Pikes Peak Expeditionary School as a newly credentialed school for 2019. Good morning, my name is Jamie Pashier, and, <laughs> and I am a school designer and regional director for Colorado, and I am so proud to announce Silverton School as a newly credentialed EL school. people you've seen. Please head out into this conference with courage and curiosity. Yes. yes, and take advantage of all there is to do. There's over a thousand great educators in this room right now. Go out, meet new people, make new connections, and build new bridges. We are all here with one big vision. Thank you for being here.